Hello everyone, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we are delighted to introduce you our second panel of the day, Sex and Art Along the Scene, with an incredible roster of panelists, uh, namely uh, Mathieu Potbonville, a philosopher and head of culture and creation department at Centre Pompidou, Tarek Lacrissi, artist and poet, Bruce Benderson, author and novelist, and the Enlightened and Enlightenment, uh, Juliette Desargues, uh, uh, critic, uh, editor, and creator. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Ooh. Thank you, Charles, for this um, very um, sweet intro introduction. Um, thank you all um, for being here today. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to Ben Charles and Art Basel for organizing this great discussion today. The way we're going to do this conversation is I'm going to give a very brief introduction um, which will be followed by uh, five minutes of presentation by each panelist, and then there'll be a kind of half-hour conversation, and then there'll be time at the end for you all to ask questions. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the talk, don't hesitate. I think we want to keep this kind of fluid and, um, and intimate, so, um, yeah, so, so do join in. Um, so, hang on, how do I do this now? Um, so I wanted to um, circle back to... Um, to contextualize this talk to a particular moment. Um, is my speaker working? Um, to um, the 19th century, which is in a way the Paris that we are surrounded by here um, and that also the Paris that we know today um, that was shaped by, um, by Haussmann, uh, the, architecture, the architect. Um, and it was a time when Paris was known as the kind of modern city of Europe. It was a symbol of modernity. And it also became a symbol of desire as people from all over flocked to the streets of Paris, um, um, also from the margins, um, flocked to the streets of Paris and in, and in a sense shaped the city um, in, in its essence. So people who were um, queer communities, sex workers. Um, and this was also very much heightened also by the architecture itself. So things like urinals um, that Hausmann built, a whole series of, it was kind of an opening of the city as a public, as a public sphere. Um, and public spaces like urinals became these places where people could have these kind of fleeting, intimate moments and intimate encounters. Um, the metro station as well, um, and there's a kind of references to the metro in Paris in the history of French literature from um, Proust that kind of um, talks about it in almost like a, a, as a bodily orifice that you enter um, and talks about it as a domain of ca caresses um, to uh, Violette Le Duc that also um, sees in her, in her book um, La Femme, which was a book that she wrote about her infatuation for Simone de Beauvoir and her un unrequited love for Simone de Beauvoir. And she talks about the metro as being this space for her own um, desire and, and, and a space of like libidinal excess. Um, uh, and, and other spaces um, that were also divide, you know, built by, by the architecture that Heisman designed, um, like dance halls, operas. This is a painting by Manny where you see um, sex workers who are accosting men. Um, but these types of balls were also masked, so people's identities could be hidden. So, this, so in a sense, same sex could also um, occur in this kind of fleeting moment. Um, uh, and then moving on to the 1920s when Paris became a, a very much queer center within Europe um, and where there was a, a very strong les lesbian culture in, in Paris. And this bar, Le Monocle, was very much at the center of this. Um, you had also um, Natalie Clifford Barney, who was um, a, a, an American lesbian writer, critic, who held many... Um, uh, uh, salons within her home that became also at the center of much of the, the queer community at the time. Um, but but um, I suppose the architecture of Hausmann is also one of, of repression and, and when it was built, um, the boulevards were designed as a way of, of, of um, uh, repressing the, the uh, popular revolt um, um, and policing um, was very much part of that society. And so that this painting by Toulouse-Lautrec is one of um, two sex workers who are standing in line um, for a medical exam for venereal diseases. Um, and so this idea of oppression 
not only because of the fact that this is a male artist painting these two women in this state of vulnerability, um, but also the system that was behind it was very much one of repression. Um, and I think that this tension between this idea that um, a city as, or an urban space, and one that is Paris, um, can be a kind of circulation of bodies and therefore a circulation of desire. And that's actually a quote that I <laughs> found in one of your poems, Derek, which I love. And I think this idea of circulation of desire is, is quite interesting within a context of a, of a city. But how that is also twinned with um, a sense of policing and repression and, and, as, and also of exclusion, which, um, <clears throat> you know, who, uh, who has access to public space to urban space, particularly when you think of the center of Paris, right, and Houseman's Paris, and questions of class, of gender, of sexuality, of race come, come very much into, into play within that. Um, so, and I think that's kind of very much at the crux of what we're talking about today, right? I certainly <laughs> hope so. <laughs> So maybe, Bruce, you could start off. So we're going to have five-minute presentations from everyone. Yes. Uh, so hang on, you told moving me on. What you're going to speak about well, uh, at the beginning, I, I decided to go through my essay, Sex and Isolation, to see if anything related to that theme. Mm. And I have to say that the planning of city space is, um, well, it's a police action that essentially makes uh, cities and neighborhoods safe for the nuclear family. That's what happened to Times Square, which I enjoyed uh, until Giuliani had uh, um, uh, turned it into a kind of um, Disneyland for tourists. Uh, before that, it was a space uh, that very much resembled what was called downtown in many American cities and what was called the Forum in ancient Rome. And um, that space of the city center is disappearing. It is no longer a space of encounters. But when it was a space of encounters, it was a place where different classes, different generations, and different races could have momentary contact with each other. Even if it was just a matter of, uh, in New York, of going to Port Authority and being bothered for loose change by a homeless person, you had an interaction with that person. No longer. So I thought I'd talk about the little unimportant city where I was born and grew up, and I'm going to try to find that in the text here. Um, uh, it's somewhere here. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I'm still talking about the erasure of libido by city planning, um, making spaces more open with less places to hide. And in small cities like Syracuse, New York, where I grew up, before the time of malls, opportunities for such clandestine contact were everywhere, and I profited from them. My father worked downtown in a neo-Gothic turn-of-the-century office building, and although my visits to it were brief, I remembered them with longing because this was a world where people existed unaccompanied by family members. My only experience of that, and these shopkeepers, lawyers, cleaning ladies, unmarried secretaries, cigarette smoking dropouts, truants, cripples, window washers, bachelor hairdressers, dentists, elevator operators, chiropractors, accountants, soda jerks, bellboys, cleaning ladies, construction workers, etc and alcoholics and homeless people, as well as divorced barmaids and probation officers, all ate in public places rather than home. They had been cut loose from the family. And in the city center, or downtown as it was called, they could actually build a life for themselves. I should add that in New York City, the majority of people who uh, created any kind of avant-garde or any kind of art movement were not married and did not have families, and they had moved to the big city to escape the oppression of the nuclear family. Um, therefore, all of my earliest homosexual experiences occurred in such a marketplace or forum or downtown, as many American cities called it. And that space has existed since ancient times, 
We are in a millennial change right now where that space is becoming diffused and unimportant. It's one of the biggest changes in human settlement that has happened since the Greeks and the Latins. But back then, if you needed to learn about sex, this was before the invention of malls, suburbs, cars that brought you in your encapsulated space to the malls so you could avoid other races, other generations, um, other classes. Back then, I'm old enough to say that if you needed to learn about sex, you obviously could not discuss your urges with your parents, but there was a healthy sampling of men for me around my parents' age who frequented the bus station or the main library restrooms, and I became a grateful and more relaxed 15-year-old when they introduced me to the pleasures of the body and also made me realize there actually were quite a few others like me. Such a thing would happen very seldomly in the cities and suburbs of today. If the so-called right attitude about sex is ever imparted, it occurs in an educational atmosphere, unfortunately, which is far from ludique, as they say in French. So I choose greyhound urinals over that any day. I hate to say it, but in my culture, at least every aspect of the infrastructure has been designed to cater to the nuclear family. Street life in some aspects may be diminishing now because of the internet, but 50 years ago, people in the American suburbs set themselves up in one isolated space with the buffer zone of a yard around it. It was called the suburbs. It was not like the French suburbs, which were arranged in a donut model and in which immigrants are sent to diffuse their, the power of their anger. In America, we had a different uh, system. Um, um, the underclass was compressed in places like Harlem, and um, therefore their anger was able to um, build up in a single space. But the French had already taken care of that, for example, by creating these suburbs, these, these circles around the city in which immigrant um, power was diffused. And uh, as proof of that, when I would come to France and people would say, where did you grow up? And I would say in the suburbs, I would expect them to realize that meant that I grew up in an upper middle class family that was protected from the cities. But when they heard la banlieue, they thought of what I thought of as the center city, which was where they had cast members of the underclass, and their system was much more effective in controlling them because it spread them all out into different housing in, in the suburbs. Our system in America put them in a concentrated inner city atmosphere that eventually exploded. And now we have cleaned up, uh, Americans have cleaned up Manhattan <laughs> and are putting people in this same donut model around the city. The poor people are no longer in the city like they were. They're around the city in a large geographical area. And because it's so spread out, they have less power to rebel and revolt. This started 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, after World War II, when the American suburbs were initiated. Uh, and they were so well planned that not only was the nuclear family isolated in this single house with a large yard separating it from their neighbors, but when they had to go somewhere, they went in their encapsulated car to a mall or to another location where they still didn't have to relate to anybody that was different than them. They got out of their car, they did their shopping, they got back in their car and they went back to their safe, middle-class nuclear family homes. Unfortunately, the nuclear family, the formula of the nuclear family is set up for family romance, which is a Freudian term, meaning it creates all kinds of hidden resentments and desires that uh, keep it from being stable. And that's led to divorces and to those who were different leaving the suburbs and going to the city. And those single people who were able to go to the city and happen to be creative 
created all the art worlds of, uh, of, of the big cities. They were rejects from the nuclear family, and, and, and they had rejected that form of isolation, right? Okay. So, um, all of this is expressed in my essay, Sex and Isolation. And that essay begins with an epigraph, which I'm going to read. Um, this is about promiscuity and isolation, the street giving way to the internet, the end of body contact among the generations, the death of the city as we know it. It is the triumph of the archetypal Protestant at home and alone with his God. Now, some people have asked me why I mentioned the end of body contact among the generations, which I think the answer to that is obvious. Once the marketplace or downtown or the forum or the central part of the city where people could encounter each other began to be dismantled, um, you didn't meet members of other generations or members of other ethnicities or members of other classes. You were able to create channels that allowed you not, you know, n not to have to encounter such people. Um, so this started in America 50 years ago, more than 50, right after World War II, when the suburbs were created. And the suburbs were were a protective institution for middle class people who felt threatened by the members of other classes, ethnicities, and who were also frightened by intergenerational relationships. Thereby, gone were the gay bars in each small American city where you'd see a doctor with his messenger boy lover or a young ex-con with the older guy who was, quote, helping him out. Those are all things that came from center city culture and that are on the wane right now. Um, but maybe the part of this epigraph, which I'll read again, this is about promiscuity and isolation, the street giving way to the internet, the end of body contact among the generations, the death of the city as we know it, the triumph of the archetypal Protestant at home and alone with his God. So perhaps the part of that epigraph that needs the most explanation is my equation of Protestantism with the internet. I did not understand that idea thoroughly until I read Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which has since become my Bible and caused me to write about the sexual styles of different cultural groups based on their influence by cultures uh, inspired by different religions. Uh, in short, what I'm trying to say is that the Protestant is never alone because unlike the Catholic, he is in direct contact with God at all times, whereas the Catholic has to go to a specialist, an intermediary, a priest with magical powers to send that message to God. So the Internet is like the perfect metaphor for Protestant living. You have the entire universe available to you all by yourself while you're alone. It is not necessary to interact with other agents in order to achieve a sense of meaning or spirituality. And that's why I see the internet as Protestant. Um, this idea led to some amusing situations, which is why I'd like to end by reading a, a short interview I did, which I've made even shorter. And it was with a graduate student in cultural studies about 15 years ago at the height of politically correct uh, sensibility. So I will read that interview to you. Student. I can't believe I'm meeting Bruce Benderson, the guy who wrote about all that sex, drugs, those criminals you described, the dangerous encounters, yet you don't look very dangerous at all. Bruce, call me tired, that never looks dangerous. Student, is it true that you've had over 4,000 sexual contacts? Bruce, at least. Student, it's probably something that we younger writers can't understand. I mean, how is it possible to have sex that many times without having any feelings for your partners? Bruce, I always feel I'm in love with the person when I'm having sex. I've never just had sex, my friend. I've made love over 4,000 times. You must have really covered the map when it came to your sex, I mean, uh, loving exploits. Did you notice any differences between types of people? <laughs> 
Bruce. Oh, yes, sex is culturally mediated, definitely. Student, could you explain that? Bruce, each country has its own sexual sensibility. Take France. Since my books are published there and I speak the language, I've had a lot of opportunity to sample French, quote, meat, as we say in certain sexual subcultures. I found that there were only two basic French modes for sex, either tenderness and romanticism, which aren't very genital, or a kind of genital macho Latin brutality, a kind of wear you out sex student. And that's different than, say, American sex? Are you kidding? I'd characterize American sex as athletic. <laughs> if it is sensual, this comes from the pleasure of the sport, an Anglo-Saxon interest in action, contact. But it's not good mental sex like French sex is. Student. These sound like stereotypes. Certainly, don't forget they're based on a generous sampling over 4,000 units of data. I'm not jumping to any conclusions student. But just having slept with a lot of French and Americans isn't any basis for these stereotypes you come up with. What about the rest of the world? You haven't had sex all around the world, Bruce. Well, I have had a lot of sex with Germans, too, and you see, I can tell you that the German sexual dichotomy is completely different from the American and the French. It revolves around the clean, dirty thing. They put you through every kind of shower, sterilization, bedding change first, then get down to the primary motive, which seems to be to soil oneself. Afterwards, they want to clean up again. It's an endless cycle. Student, are you saying all Germanic culture is like that? Bruce, no, the several hundred or so Dutch I've slept with were pretty different. I'd borrow a term from Max Weber to say that Dutch sex is shaped by the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. It's a bit like manufacturing, ingenious, efficient, cost-effective, practical in other words, a cottage industry too, with all those brothels. Student. I'm just going to cut you there. I think we need to move on probably to, to okay. the next presentation. That's okay. That's um, fine. <laughs> I didn't hear one person laugh, so I'm glad to stop. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was great. We enjoyed it very much. But maybe better we could move on to your, um, before we get into a discussion, onto what you were in your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Juliette. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to apologize for my poor English, especially after your wonderful prosody. <laughs> I mean, musically, it will be a, a mess. Uh, I doubt uh, that. For, sorry for your ears. Uh, uh, and thank you, Bruce, for having reminded that uh, the maybe the, the, the more important word in the title of our conversation is not art, nor sex, nor sand, but along. Uh, how is it possible to, to get along and to meet people along the sand, along somewhere? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a problem in city, and, and that's always a struggle in the city to, to, to keep some spaces, some places to be along and to, to, to have, uh, you know, intercourses, conversations, etc. It reminded me that, uh, uh, it reminded me this performance by, by the Chinese artist Chai Ko Chang. Uh, a few years ago, during the Nuit Blanche, she invented this performance named uh, Amour d'un soir, uh, one night stand, and uh, I don't know if you know that, but uh, uh, not only pre he prepared uh, some fireworks as usual, but he also uh, started to to uh, um, publish some ads on amateur porn, we porn websites oh. to to rent people to to have sex along the Seine during the fireworks. So when <laughs> the Mairie de Paris discovered it, it was quite complicated. So uh, here I have a thought for uh, all organizers in the world that have to deal with such <laughs> artistic issues, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, that's, that's the struggle for maintaining so those, those spaces. Uh, a small remark before to begin. Uh, I'm slightly embarrassed that we are uh, three main men, uh, three males on this panel. So thank you, Juliette, for being there. Maybe Paris is one of the last cities where something like that is possible. I find uh, it a little vintage, you know, uh, to, to be like that. So uh, to maybe I'll try to calibrate to, uh, by, by quoting mostly uh, women and trans artists, because I think it's important, especially on this issue, to, uh, for, it's of course, a, a, a based, uh, strongly based issues, and you always have to have this in mind. Um, that, well, uh, um, if I look at this title, uh, Sex and Art Along the Seine, 
I'd like to add some more word, and in a way you, you, you started with that, which is history. Uh, before, to work, before working at the Centre Pompidou, I'm, I'm a philosopher and I'm a specialist of Michel Foucault, who wrote, as you know, a, a great book, many books, uh, named History of Sexuality. Uh, warning, it's not sexual at all. It's, it's a sex, uh, it's a less sexy uh, book in the world, but it's interesting, uh, yeah. nevertheless. Um, and I mean that uh, it's really important to, to, to uh, take into account that uh, sex is not a constant reality. Uh, it's not something that always urges in the same way, but sex in itself, sex as an experience, has uh, knows events, knows changes along history, and that affects uh, strongly affects art. For example, and I, I thought about this uh, this exhibition, uh, an exhibition that occurred, that or, or, or was organized not far from here, uh, in the Musée d'Art Moderne a few years ago. I found this description in Elisabeth Lebovitz's book. I don't know if you know this book, uh, What AIDS Did to Me, Ce que le Sida m'a fait. It's a wonderful book about uh, uh, art in the times of AIDS. And in this book, she describes a particular exhibition named uh, L'hiver de l'amour, the winter of love, and uh, it was in 1994, uh, in the middle of the, the crisis, I'm, I mean, uh, 10 years after the beginning of the pandemics, and uh, that's wha what she describes, uh, a, few, uh, a few words. Uh, this installation is a stop, the sign of an end of rain, that of a culture of the exhibition and of the display that feed exclusively Paris and New York. David Hammonds and Ryan Piper, the two African-American artists invited, propose a way through. A few lines after. The winter of love inaugurates an age of affective exhibition driven by no other logic than that of sensations of the sensorial compounds that are constructed here independently of the syntax of the words and the artists. Out of it work, First of all, by living art as a category stabilized by the museum, by interfering with its routine, by inhabiting it at any time, by proposing to the public to relive the museum in the same way that certain artists build their ecosystem there. Vidya Gastaldon, you have a picture there, uh, then a student in Grenoble, lives in her sterile bubble every Saturday from 3 p.m. Dominique Gonzalez Forrester consults, etc. I find this description very interesting because uh, she shows, uh, for, uh, according to Elizabeth, uh, not only Vidya Castaldon is a metaphor of the uh, uh, love in time of AIDS by living in pla plastic, by uh, the impossibility of being touched uh, uh, and touching. But uh, what uh, uh, Elizabeth insists is that this exhibition changes something to the art regime of existence uh, by inviting art uh, Afro-American artists, by uh, uh, defining a new way of creating exhibitions, uh, months, maybe a more sensorial one at uh, once, by uh, uh, allowing durational performances. Uh, she, she shows how in, in the middle of AIDS crisis and uh, in close relation with this collective experience that affected the, 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 the world of, artistics, of artists, something deeply changed in the art world. And I think that's quite interesting to, 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 to remind that, that uh, art and sex are linked in the same history, and it's a deep history. It's not only the history of before we were, we were uh, uh, censored and now we are free, or before we were free and now you can't say anything, etc. It's more deeper than that. It's deeper than that. And uh, um, uh, it also, uh, one more thing I could say, that uh, it's also changing, changes something in the art of the past. I mean, those events, don't uh, change only the, the, the current art, but they also change. If you can come back to the previous image, this image of Jen uh, 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 Manon, uh, um, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful, very moving, very uh, sweet and tragic painting uh, that uh, you could uh, uh, see a uh, few few weeks ago in the exhibition that uh, um, uh, Angela Lamp uh, uh, built on the new objectivity in Berlin. Because uh, when you address the, the question of new objectivity these days, you can't avoid to show 
things about uh, minority sexuality, uh, about the, the gay and lesbian world in the, the 2020s, etc. I mean, that, yeah, what occurs now changes the past, changes your look on the past, and I think that that's a great thing. So I think that the, the, the problem that we could uh, uh, discuss together today uh, would be what, what are we contemporary of? Uh, what are the events in sexuality uh, uh, global experience that changes something in our way of feeling, in our way of meeting people, in our way of creating also? That's only a question, but maybe, Tarek, you have the answer. So <laughs> I leave the floor to you. <laughs> um, thank you. It works? Oui, vous m'entendez? OK. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mathieu, so much. And uh, also thank you for pointing the... Um, the absence of uh, queer women also, but just in general, women in the conversation. Um, so I'm here to represent the people of color, <laughs> uh, to jump on that. Um, so my position would be more like as an artist, so I'm just gonna talk for my basically position as an artist, as a poet. Um, <clears throat> so I actually didn't really grow up in the center of Paris. I grew up in the banlieue. So just to start us off as like a, uh, ge ge like the question of ge geography and how geography like kind of um, impacts my practice. So I grew up actually close to Poitiers, where Michel Foucault is born, <laughs> yeah. uh, in the city called uh, Châtellerault. Um, and um, <clears throat> I, um, when I was 18, uh, I decided to move to Paris uh, to be queer uh, and to study uh, specifically in university. So I studied like literature uh, and theater. And um, uh, literature has been very important for me because when I was uh, younger, when I was 16 or 17, I actually discovered um, Jean Genet, who had this really huge impact uh, in my practice, uh, also in my desire. And um, I've been also really like very uh, impacted by this kind of like aesthetics choices that Jean Genet was doing in his writing, uh, specifically uh, also this kind of like uh, fusion with uh, Le Vulgaire and uh, Le Supreme and the miracle, so something about like high standards and uh, much more like uh, uh, yeah, vulgar subjects like graphic sex, for example, <laughs> uh, uh, descriptions. And um, <clears throat> so I kind of like moved to Paris, and uh, I actually quickly uh, was kind of like reflecting of how, how was how weird it was for me to actually read Jean Genet when I was only 17, because it's actually quite violent and quite intense, uh, but also beautiful. And how, um, when I actually moved to Paris when I was 18, um, I actually had this very uh, interesting relation to sex, and uh, how this weirdness and this kind of like sexual kind of like thing also kind of like was a very uh, emotional in a sense. And I, this is something that I really like with Jean Genet, it's the whole like also um, kind of like constriction between emotions and, um, and raw descriptions. And uh, I also quickly um, started to work in this bookstore called Les Mots à la Bouche, who used to be in the Marais, uh, so the gay neighborhood in Paris. And it was Rue Saint-Croix de la Bretonnerie. And uh, this bookstore kind of started kind of opened in the early 80s and he kind of like created a gay neighborhood with another bar called Le Central, uh, who also closed. And uh, obviously all the um, big other bars like uh, Le Palace, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I really enjoyed because this kind of like relation to the Marais and to actually the gay French history because I realized that I didn't have really people to talk to, and actually having like lesbian mothers and gay fathers <laughs> uh, was actually very interesting in this kind of like also reflection of like uh, the impact of obviously uh, HIV and AIDS um, uh, history in the in the gay gay in in the gay culture, but also like as a young queer. Uh, and brown body, what it means for me uh, to actually evolve uh, in this space, uh, specifically in terms of like ex exotifications, uh, fetishizations of, of course of my body. And um, I, um, I, I kind of like also feel like I started my 
political awareness with lesbians <laughs> uh, as a shout out. And uh, this bar called La Mutinerie was a very huge, uh, uh, for me, a huge space of transformation and uh, queer politics. And um, um, I feel like this circulation of desire that I also mentioned uh, and that I wrote in my text were really present in this bookstore as a place that is sometimes political, sometimes not, as a place where there is, it was not a cruising place, but it was also a cruising place, uh, and also as a space that's like kind of like almost uh, hard to describe and to get. And um, I, um, I actually finally discovered much more, let's say, uh, political potentialities when I moved uh, to New York and Montreal, but I will maybe talk about this later. But to maybe go back on my practice, I uh, recently uh, started with this uh, series called Perfume of Traitors, which is a, a direct um, uh, allusion to, uh, a direct reference to Jean Genet. So I was always obsessed with his figure and the way that he lied and the way that he created his own myth uh, as Jean Genet. And uh, I kind of like also realized that throughout his whole life, um, actually the philosophy of betrayal was uh, his way to access to freedom. And I started to reflect on this question of like what it means to have a back on the knife. And uh, I started to create this uh, different knives that you're seeing here. So there's like betraying family, betraying uh, community, betraying my name, and how uh, actually we're all betraying. And actually betraying is fine. Betraying can be fun. <laughs> uh, and uh, all the kind of controversial uh, philosophies that come from uh, Jean Genet uh, has still like kind of like again an impact in my life. And... Um, we can maybe um, show more like the, the devil horns. Um, so there's the betrayal and there is the evil. <laughs> and Jean Genet is also an evil person. Um, and the, pl the place of the evil and the devil kind of like also was a way for me to create this like glass horns uh, that were like coming from the, the wall and that's the, um, the, the the, um, the devil and the whole idea of the perversion was actually quite radical, especially as a queer of color body. Like we I have the right to be a pervert and actually reclaim it. And for me, the whole like place of the devil and the whole like, yeah, like if we think about, you know, Disney movies and like all the, all the villains are all actually inspired by um, queer figures. You know, if we think about uh, Ursula in The Little Mermaid, who's uh, actually inspired by uh, Divine, um, the, the, the famous drag queen. And um, I mean, all of this to say that all this kind of like uh, different um, like aspects to Jean Genet was really huge in my practice, and it's kind of like a perfect way to start conversations. And what I love, what I love with Jean Genet, the figure of Jean Genet, uh, is that he also was he kind of betrayed his own whiteness in a way because he was a very proud and a pretty vocal. Um, defendant of the Palestinians, uh, of the Algerians, um, and um, and the Black Panthers also. So he kind of like had this really political awareness that was really uh, controversial at that at that time. And he always say that he couldn't be uh, that political without desire and without feeling desire for Arabs and Blacks, which is so problematic, but very interesting in that sense. And I love the whole like. Uh, kind of like um, ambivalence that there is with <laughs> this figure. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Yeah, I think you touched upon a few things here that I think would be interesting to to address. And this idea, I think, of um, maybe going back to the question itself that at stake of can um, uh, a form of eroticism or desire within art is that can that be a very a powerful tool for like a critique of the social order? Um. Well, I, I actually would like to respond to both yeah, um, to please. both presentations. 
um, about the, the, what you were saying about Elizabeth's book and um, how, how, how it tried to show changes in art during the period of AIDS. In my opinion, that was the, about the effect of an illness upon the art community rather than a change in sexuality uh, on the art community because uh, everyone I knew, um, their sexuality did not change during AIDS, just their worry about its repercussions change. But it, for me, it brings up a larger issue, and that's the fact that art and sex don't really go together and don't really work when the repressions to sex are removed. And I dealt with this in my book about James Bidgood, the maker of Pink Narcissus, who created these incredibly de decorative uh, photos of, of, of very appealing young men in handmade costumes in fantasy scenarios. And the, when he did that, it was illegal to show genitals in America. I don't know what was happening in France, but in America it was illegal to show genitals in photography. So game, um, James Bidger's extremely articulated decorative photos were actually an alibi for getting you off. When I was uh, 17 years old, I would buy a magazine called Muscle Boy that showed no genitals, but it showed young men communicating sexual messages in an extremely decorative and extremely aestheticized way. And the moment that you could show genitals, art <laughs> was completely disposed of. And it was just uh, there for the uh, pleasure of looking at bodies, looking at genitals, looking at sex. So I think the only good art that was ever created was art that had to deal with sexual repression and to find an alibi around it and that led to an aesthetic once that was no longer necessary i do not think that there 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 was much interesting um sexual art or erotic art erotic art was the art of repression it was the art of all well, i can't show everything so i'm going to suggest in every way possible which created a, a a very compelling aesthetic so that's what i want to say about what you said what i want to say about you said is really it, it it's going to sound very obnoxious but I believe that the reason that Genet became the darling of the literary establishment and the reason that Genet wrote Saint Genet is because Genet had a bourgeois academic voice. He wrote exactly like you're supposed to write when you're a member of the academy. While that was happening, America, starting with the lost generation and Hemingway and people like that, was displaying a middle-class voice, okay, which actually provided a bit more freedom because it allowed more experimentation. And it wasn't until Walbeck came along that the middle-class voice ever surfaced in France. There are no books. There were no books that, that portrayed middle-class consciousness. There were only books that portrayed um, extremely aestheticized transgression, and Genet was one of the people who portrayed it, but not one of those members of the literary establishment would have ever supported Genet if he did not have this, uh, this, this, this language of the academy. So for me, Genet was not somebody that inspired me that much for that reason, because even though the, um, uh, the voice described transgressive and criminal activities, it was described in an extremely elevated uh, voice from the French Academy. So that's what I wanted yeah. to say about that and what I wanted but to say. Someone, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. just to jump on that. I was, of course, but also as someone who hated uh, bourgeois <laughs> people, if we think about like uh, his relationship to like Jean Cocteau, for example, and like who was actually representing more like the Almost sure. Are, yeah. More than that. Yeah. There's the uh, cocteau during the occupation. That's a whole other subject. But, <laughs> but go ahead. Matthew, would you want to respond? Um, yeah, I, I do. I do agree with the fact that uh, art uh, can be a response to uh, uh, censorship and to repression of sexuality, and one of the main uh, uses and one of, of the main uh, 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 sources of creativity in art is trying to <laughs> find ways right. uh, to to, right. to 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 get erotic, uh, even if you you repress, etc. But I think that. Uh, 
it's, maybe it's not the only possible use of art. I mean, for example, these days, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the main question that some artists are dealing with is, is not the, the question of transgression, of transgressing the, uh, transgressing the, the, the social norms and finding strong uh, 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 responses uh, in order to break the social order. Because right. uh, on one hand, uh, uh, transgression in itself became a problematic concept in a way. Uh, because uh, 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 I think that uh, these, uh, these, these days uh, uh, we, we, we moved from uh, sexuality as a critique of social order to the critique of social order as it exerts itself in sexuality. I mean that uh, critique of, of the patriarchy is uh, uh, what about social order in the sexuality in itself, you know, and that's why I chose uh, Louise Bourgeois' work uh, in, uh, in the, the PowerPoint because Louise Bourgeois foreseen that, uh, she, she saw that uh, you had to, to, to deal with, uh, you, you can't only uh, count on sexuality to transgress if sexuality in itself is a relation of power in, uh, within uh, 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 itself. So, but then so the flip side of that would be also how can can art therefore, if we're talking about desire, and can art also talk about perversity and taboo issues? Um, um, you know, as a as a you know, to what extent can is there a place within art to do that? I think that uh, I think that art can address those questions, but uh, art can't be considered simply as an ally or as a vector for social critique yeah. uh, if you ha if you, you 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 have to critique the social order in uh, sexuality then maybe you have to deal with uh, social order or social uh, 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 power in artistic world for example but i I also uh, chose uh, uh, an image from uh, uh, Claude Lévesque. Mm. We had a problem with Claude Lévesque last year. Uh, a what very that, big uh, problem. Uh, what was that? He asked uh, me to write about him. That's what I want to know. Yeah, well, well because uh, uh, some inquiries, journalist inquiries, showed that uh, Claude Lévesque uh, uh, was probably a pedophile, uh, a sincere, a genuine pedophile. Oh. And he said Sweet. something very interesting. Yeah. Uh, about that, he said, well, nothing was hidden. Everything was on the table. Uh, everything, you, you, uh, if you look mm. some of Claude Levesque's Levis work, works, you see that it's about children's, uh, uh, children and desire in a very sincere uh, 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 perspective. But as everybody thought that it was some kind of a transgressive uh, uh, artwork, Nobody sincerely asked if it was uh, just a description <laughs> or a trap or something else. So for me, it's a real problem. Uh, when art becomes a, a, a vector of power in the name of transgression. And so that's why I think that uh, uh, well, artists... It's really, really, really interesting that you brought up pedophilia because... Um, and I actually wrote about it in a book, the birth of gay liberation, at least in America, uh, one, of the, one of the vectors was pedophilia, it, but it was expressed yeah. in the way of, do children have a right to sexuality? Of course. And does their sexuality have to be controlled? Now, when this changed and the American, um, uh, the, the American hysteria about pedophilia Pedophilia came to France. Tony Duvert's career was completely destroyed. He ended up, you know, rotting, dying, and rotting in a small village without anyone even yeah. noticing him. And just a f uh, and just ten years before, he had he had won, uh, I think it was the Prix Medici or, or, or an award like that. There were ways of expressing pedophilic desires at the very beginning of gay liberation in the 70s that were considered interesting and valid. And this. Um, uh, this was discussed at a meeting in Boston, one of the seminal meetings at, uh, at the birth of gay liberation in which Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, and other cultural people came and discussed the right of children to have sexual mm -hmm. feelings. And at the same time over here, Tony Duver was considered a great writer. Suddenly there was a big 
change in all of that. And that was buried under the carpet. And the gay liberationists who became gay assimilationists after left that part out of the platform. And at the same time, uh, writers like Tony Duver were considered anathema. And, and he completely lost yeah. his career. Yeah. So, I mean, when we say, but oh, we found out Claude Lack uh, had pedophilic but desires, that, that, I can't just Tarek, take I it I think Tarek say. wanted to, 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 to No, but like, interject. just maybe to go back on um, what you asked at the beginning, like your first question. Um, I feel like, I mean, I'm not sure about this whole, like, sex and art, but I feel like... Um, um, Maybe it's also maybe like a way to open the conversation, I guess, with the, the audience. Uh, but it's more like to, I try to like, try to understand also the impact, I guess, in some, all the figures that we've been talking. And uh, I mean, specifically, like, personally, the figures that have been very, like, uh, important to me. And, and, um, and I feel like it's interesting to address these questions today because we've been talking just before this kind of like, almost old school, like kind of, or, uh, let's say, conversation. But I, I'm just a bit, I, I just want to open open up more to the audience and like see if there's like any um, questions or remarks or comments. I would like to add one more thing to the discussion, <laughs> may I? Yes. Yeah. Or am I talking too much? You, you, may, you may, you may. Okay, I'll make it short. Uh, it, it's something about the relationship between um, AIDS, sex and art in my life. Uh, in the mid-80s, I was your usual terrified middle-class homosexual who was examining pimples under bright lights and running to the doctor with a cough. Uh, this was before there was even a test for AIDS, although I put mine off for quite a few years because I was convinced even though it wasn't true that I I I was going that I was carrying the AIDS virus, so I was a totally neurotic um, middle class homosexual who one day uh, was given a book called Saul's Book, which was about the relationship between a Puerto Rican heroin addict and an older ex con, um, uh, um, and this book so thrilled me that I sought out these bars, which were hustler bars in Times Square. And uh, the first time that I ever went to one was on my birthday, which also happens to be the date of the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, I went uh, to a um, hustler bar in Times Square, which was crowded with people from the South Bronx, like the people who were selling their bodies were drug dealers, uh, the poorest people in New York, mostly Puerto Rican and Dominican. And they were partying. They were under more risk than I was, and they were having the greatest time uh, in this bar. It was festive. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm at home looking at pimples under a bright light. And these people who are heroin addicts, uh, male hustlers, um, live in the most dangerous neighborhood in New York, are in this bar laughing at the top of their lungs, partying, um, having a good time. And it cured me of my um, um, obsession with myself and my own health. But not only did it cure me, but their lives, because I had never been exposed to so many people from that class before, their language, their lives, their feelings, their culture inspired me to such a degree that my entire oeuvre for the next 15 years was writing about that world. And it was fear of AIDS that sent me to those bars, and that was the cure for my fear of AIDS. I just wanted to add that. Are there any questions from anyone? <laughs> 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 that boring, huh? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your for for this really interesting uh, um, sort of overview. Something that's both uh, historical, but we get a sense of your personal lives. It's an interesting form of uh, both testimony and conceptual thinking about art. Um, I wanted to say, perhaps, on the question of pedophilia, because it sort of a become, became the, the elephant in the room, um, I think we don't, it's a complicated thing to, to address, but I think we don't allow, when, when we think of someone like Gabriel Matzneff, someone who's a heterosexual, 
and who develops this in, in his uh, literature. Uh, we don't allow them um, the creative freedom to address these things in writing. And we don't believe that there's a, an aesthetic potential transgression in their writing. I think it, it might be worthwhile to consider that we should maybe not allow for that type of um, um, artistic space or elbow room or that, that, that ability to play with genre and to play with transgression just because the artist is queer, right? Just something to, 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 to consider. Um, I don't think there's an, uh, and I think of ethics here, in, not in the sense of good and evil, but ethics in the sense of putting intention in the way we cultivate our subjectivity and the way that we uh, make and remake the self. And this is about modernity, right? And the modern self is, is a, an ethical uh, stake. I don't think there's, there's ethical potential in allowing for, um, for that sort of subjective and artistic elbow room just because we're playing with sexual transgression altogether, if that makes sense. But my question actually, uh, has to do with uh, something that Mathieu, and I apologize, I forgot your last name, that Mathieu asked at the end of, of his intervention about what, what type of contemporary moments are we going through that changes our affects? What, what are the events that affect our affects and the ways that we feel, and the types of structure of feeling that we engage and that we construct? Here I'm thinking of Raymond Williams, the, the, the cin cinema critic and literary critic. Um, um, my, to be more precise, because I'm not just going to reiterate your question, what are the, the, the spatial forms that are artistic, but also urbanistic, have to do with industry, have to do with the way we carry our bodies in space? What are we experiencing now with this type of great works, great aesthetic uh, endeavor that is happening to Paris from the outskirts towards the inside, rather than the classical house minion? Um, movement from the center to the outside. W what are the dynamics today that you all here on this panel can identify in terms of the contemporary moment we're experiencing? And what is it going to do to the affects and the sexual affects and the type of uh, subject positions of sexual transgression that we allow ourselves to engage? Yeah, I, think, I think this idea of, um, I guess it's a question of af access as well to urban space, right? And 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 how that's determined by different um, parameters. I mean, yeah, different conditions, different subjectivities, different identities, and, and um, questions of class, of sexuality, of gender and race all come into that. I mean, Paris is um, seeing a kind of uh, renaissance, or that's how it's been described. But to what extent? Do we feel that is the case? I don't know, Derek, maybe you could answer on uh, that. Yeah, I just wanted to, thank you. I, I just wanted to um, thank you for your question. And uh, to also jump on the, so I, I, I'm from the outskirts and I grew up there and it's kind of shaped all my uh, identity. Uh, and then I wanted to be at the center. So I was in the center. And now I'm back uh, in the outskirts and I actually find that the outskirts are much more uh, interesting, much more, um, weird, much more, there's much more potentialities in that spaces um, because it's kind of like coming back as a circle for me and also because I feel like for me the center is dead and the whole like, uh, let's say if we think about the Marais but all these kind of like spaces, nobody, I mean, maybe some other people, can, some people go there but not all the like next generations and I feel like there is kind of like, for me, this really important idea of like investing the the banlieue as a as actually a political space, and it's already happening. And there's already like many revolutions in in also in, in spaces, uh, in fa in faces that we don't talk about, that we don't see, that are usually much more anonymous. And if we think about also like sex, there is so many like sex stuff happening, but nobody knows uh, what ha what's happening because uh, it's. Uh, it's uh, racialized, it's, it's mainly uh, between poor people, so there is this kind of like also contempt in that sense. And uh, I feel like there is also like a, polit a political like project around that, that I feel like can be, I mean, should exist much more, if that yeah. makes sense. 
I couldn't agree with you more about what you just said, and that's because anything that occurs uh, in the city, in the city center, in the mainstream city, is immediately co-opted by commerce. It's like you can't make a radical statement without seeing it on TV advertising a new automobile like a month later. So if there is, I believe that all avant-garde grew out of a bohemia, a kind of bohemia. And you can't have a bohemia in the city anymore because it's so, so connected to commerce and so co-opted so immediately. And so what are the bohemian spaces in America? They're small and they're scattered now. Like you'll go to Detroit, which has a small radical culture that is so broken down and so poor that what's happening is not being co-opted by um, Ford Motors. Uh, so I agree with you that, that the, this is where the interesting people are now. They're scattered outside of the city in small communities of their own making. And if there ever will be a new avant-garde, it will come out of these fragmented bohemias. And I think that's pretty much what you were saying as well. Mathieu, do you have anything to add to that? No, I have nothing to add about uh, how the city rebuilt the effect. Because uh, basically, I, I don't leave the song Pompidou. Uh, <laughs> oh, I stop live in it. it. Uh, I have to go back, you know. So it, <laughs> I, I hardly know the city. <laughs> oh, stop. But maybe uh, two things uh, about this question of um, uh, what is this contemporary moment in relation what, with what you, you said about... Uh, about uh, Levesque and pedophilia, etc. I think that we are experimenting two two main transformations, and those transformations ha uh, have to be thought, have to be experienced, and have to be artistically elaborated. Uh, the first one is for me: we are dealing with uh, a, a transition from the main question of desire to the main question of the relation between desire and consent. And this appearing of the problem of consent is not only some kind of, you know, a bigotry that would be, uh, or hysteria, even if it has, uh, uh, it can have uh, hysterical uh, manifestations, of course. But it's a revolution uh, to uh, uh, deal with consent inside the regime of, of desire, because uh, 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 I, I well, I had uh, brought a, a, a quote by Maggie Nelson quoting Tanesi quotes about that. Uh, she says that uh, we, 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 we are uh, 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 tired of this concept of radical freedom, which has to do with uh, the uh, indifference and s the selfishness uh, with the other, etc. So we have to invent some elaboration of, this, of the desire uh, uh, within this uh, uh, problem of consent, this, this experience of consent. And artists can help us about that, I guess. Uh, I guess that artists has to, to, to do something with uh, the, this question of, of uh, intimate agreement uh, and about the, the problem it raises, about the, the difficulties it has, about the dangerous and troubled uh, experience of being troubled by someone. It, is it something with your, you're okay with? Is the person okay with that? So what, what happens here? here? Uh, for me, Louise Bourgeois, uh, I, I repeat that, is the main artist of our time, uh, uh, you, you have to re-read, you have to rethink her work because that's her problem. Uh, and well, that's for me, that's the first transformation. And the second one is that maybe we are uh, moving from trans a moment of transgression to a moment of transformation or transition or trans-something <laughs> or trans-feminism, for example. And that, that's not the same trance thing, you know. It's from a breakthrough uh, to how do you transform yourself. Of course, we didn't, we, we, we don't, uh, we didn't invent the, 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 the transgender uh, uh, things these days. You know, it's something that uh, <laughs> exists from a very long time. And, uh, uh, well, but, but uh, the importance... Uh, these days that we, we, we call to, to this experience says something about the problem we have is how to be transformed uh, 
how to transform ourselves individually and collectively through the experience of sexuality, of trans identity, etc. But by why I, I quoted some of, of Smith's <coughs> works because Smith is a photographer who goes from transgender to transgalactic things, and I think that's the 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 truth of, of our times that you you have to transform not only to transgress but to transform, and that's not exactly the same artistical and yeah. philosophical problem. And there is a huge, oh. uh, right now, there is a huge uh, remise en question, the, the whole movement of like queer, like queer theory, uh, mostly uh, from trans people. And there is a lot like, like now, uh, a whole new movement that's like happening, re-questioning like yeah. all this kind of like yeah. uh, heritage and actually uh, rethinking everything. And yeah. I feel like it's so, so exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's I think, I think we're gonna we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to cut. We're gonna have to end this now. Thank I'm you. afraid we're out of time. But I think that's a great oh, way but to I end. I have the most oh. important question that <laughs> people can answer right away. I just maybe we maybe we can finish this um, in the in the bar because I think we need to move on to the next well, talk. It's just one question, one sentence, <laughs> and I just want to know if cancel culture exists in France. That's all. Okay, you can end. Well, now. on that note. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you.